Welcome to HPAC's first ever How I Prepared for the MCAT panel and q and I'm joined today by three of our UCR alumni who will be sharing with you details of how they have been successful in preparing for the MCAT, primarily through self-preparation modalities. Before we get too deep into speaking to our panelists, I want to give you all a um, brief view of the MCAT basics so we all make sure we're on the same page with the language that we're using. The MCAT is the Medical College Admissions Test, and it is a seven hour and 30 minute sit time for the total exam with six hours and 15 minutes of content time. These six hours and 15 minute of content time is broken down into four sections. The exam is uh, administered in this order with the physical and chemical foundations of living systems being the first section of the MCAT with a short break. Then you'll move on to the critical analysis and reading skills section, which is very regularly referred to as CARS. Then you will have an optional mid-exam break before returning to the second half of the exam, which is the biological and biochemical foundations of living systems, another short break, and lastly, concluding with the psychological and sociological behaviors system. Again, the total sit time of the test, including breaks, is seven hours and 30 minutes with six hours and 15 minutes of content time. Something that makes the MCAT very unique is there is an optional void question at the end of the exam where a student can sit for the entire MCAT and at the end of the exam, decide to void the test where the test is not scored or reported to either the student or a medical school. The total score range for the MCAT ranges from a 472 as the lowest score possible and a 528 as the highest score possible. The average score of students accepted to USMD programs is a 511, which equates to an 85th percentile on this exam. There is much, much, much more information I could provide to you about the MCAT, but these are the basics. There is a supplemental handout that you're welcome to collect via this QR code or the link that was provided in the chat. At this point, I would like to move on to an introduction of our panelists. Okay, so hello everyone. My name is uh, Nick Allegre. I'm currently a UCR alumni uh, who majored in the CMDB major. And right now I've applied to AMCAS and I'm going through that whole application process. Hi everyone, my name is Valeria Ragazina. I graduated from UCR in 2020 uh, with a psych degree, and I'm currently a first year med student at SLU, uh, St. Louis University School of Medicine. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Okendo Omaganesume, but I do go by OG for short just because it's significantly shorter. Um, I am also a recent UCR alum, I graduated last year in 2021 with a degree in Neuro and Econ uh, for my minor, and then um, currently a first year at uh, Yale School of Med. Thank you so much, panelists. So with that, we're going to jump into our questions and we do already have a question from our audience that's re, uh, related to Nick. So Nick, um, can you share how your CMDB upper division classes helped with MCAT content? Yeah, so I, I personally think that CMDB did a very good job at some of the biological aspects of the MCAT. Uh, for example, a lot of questions related to uh, cells or when you're trying to understand how different 
uh, types of physiologies work at, at the molecular level. I feel that the cellular major that I had gave me that advantage because I was able to easily kind of visualize different particles uh, or different amounts of solutes. However, I will say though that this is kind of a double-edged sword because the uh, topic that I historically did worse on in the MCAT uh, was the psychological portion. I had a very little amount of psychological preparation uh, because of my major. And so learning this section was kind of like studying a class from the ground up. I wasn't too familiar with any neural pathways, any types of experiments. Uh, and so whenever I did my practice tests, that was consistently what I personally felt was weakest. Thanks, Nick. Again, if you have any questions specific to a panelist or all panelists, feel free to put those into the chat and I will moderate those to our students. We have a few coming in, so I'm gonna read those and get prepared. But as I um, compile those questions, I'd like each panelist to tell us, when did you sit for the exam? And how many times did you take the exam? How long did you prepare for the exam? Thank you. So I could start for this. Uh, so personally for me, my MCAT story is a little bit of a mess. I originally was scheduled to uh, take it on the September during the summer of my junior year going into senior year. Uh, however, unfortunately, I did have a kind of personal circumstance that happened, and I knew that I wouldn't be able to take it at that time and still perform my best. Uh, so then during that time, I rescheduled it to a January of my senior year exam. Uh, but unfortunately, that actually was pushed back again because of COVID. My exam location uh, was canceled. Uh, and so eventually, I settled on a February exam date because I knew I was kind of at my prime. I had studied and I knew this would be the best time for me to take it. Uh, I personally took the MCAT once and I prepared for about six months maybe, uh, factoring in my January, February exam testing date. Yeah, I actually have almost the exact same story as you. Uh... I was scheduled to take it during the spring of my junior year and then coming up on that like I just didn't feel prepared I didn't have a good um schedule going and I was like this is just not gonna happen at this point so I rescheduled it also to January of my senior year because I did want to um, apply as soon as I graduated and take that gap year. So I wanted to take it by January just in case I had to take it again or, you know, figure out what schools I would be able to apply to with that score. Um, but yeah, I did end up only taking it once. And I also spent about six months preparing. I started the summer before senior year for content review. And then I just kept going throughout uh, fall quarter but I wasn't spending like hours upon hours every single day on the MCAT just because I was also taking classes. So it was really more spread out. You don't necessarily need six months. It just depends what else you're doing and all that. Yeah, I completely agree with um, the previous panelists as well. I think um, taking it, it while doing classes or studying while doing classes is definitely um, comes with its own set of challenges, trying to balance that. Um, I So I the first time I took it, so I took it twice. Uh, the first time I took it was the summer after my sophomore year, and it was um, a little bit, I think it was a bit of a challenge. I think a lot of the basic content was like really fresh out of my mind, having taken all of like the basic classes for my first two years. Um, and so I thought that was going to be kind of an advantage, but it played out like, um, I don't know, I don't, I wouldn't know how it played out like in the long term of things, because I took that the first three months to do it up until the end of my summer, where I studied about two months for it all together that first time. Um, and then I didn't get a score that I was happy with. And then um, we took it again and um, in the winter break. So it was like right after the fall quarter of my junior year, I took it again so I could have it ready to apply um, at the end of my junior year. Um, and I believe that, so total, I would say three months. So the first two months for the first time and then one month in the, um, in the break in the first like two weeks of um, winter quarter. Thank you guys. 
So we have a couple other questions that have come through the chat relating to uh, timeline or academic preparation. Um, and this is for all of you or anybody who wants to answer. Were there, um, were there any classes that you particularly found helpful for MCAT prep? And, and there's kind of two layers to that is how effective did you find your undergraduate um, lower division courses like Gen Chem, Gen Bio, O Chem Physics? How well did you feel that those courses helped you adequately prepare for the MCAT? As well as were there any upper division classes that you found particularly helpful for your MCAT prep? So you're welcome to uh, approach either or both aspects of that question. Yeah, so I feel like the UCR prereqs prepared me really well. Like there was very little on the exam that wasn't covered, at least in the hard sciences. Um, it's just more of a challenge of reviewing it all at the same time, integrating it a little bit, and also learning like the so-called double AMC logic for how they want you to approach these types of questions. Um, in terms of the psych so soch section, I can definitely see how people who weren't a chess major would not really be as prepared for that because even if you take like a breadth psych two or one, um, it does not cover all the topics that are on there. So I would suggest a good review book or just a resource that you have uh, to learn psych social on your own. Um, but other than that, yeah. So just to clarify the question, it was um, classes from UCR that helped prepare it and then other like specific MCAT classes as well? Good follow-up question. So how effective were the like the life science core courses in helping you prepare? And were there upper division courses, genetics, okay. uh, biochem, to Nick's point being CMDD, was there anything helpful at the upper division level? So um, from kind of my experiences, I think um, I only, so the first time I took it, I only went into it with pretty much all of the um, core content. So just like all of the basics up until before I started taking most of my upper division classes. And I thought they gave like a really good like core background, but there was a lot of extra information that I feel like I really needed to like um, try to look up from just other content books and everything else to like really solidify it for me. Uh, just cause like, as um, as Valeria mentioned earlier, there's sort of like the MCAT logic and sort of like what are the types of questions or what are the type of like, uh, I guess, answers that they're looking for. And so there's definitely a lot of like, I think, extra work that still needs to be put in to really cement what you're looking to um, get out of it, which is to do well. But um, I think it's like, like a really, really good base that you can then build off of and do the content for. Uh, as far as like upper divisions, when I took it my second time, I take it like, I think um, a couple like some molecular bio classes and like a couple of narrow classes that I think just helped for those specific like portions of like bio or chem phys. But um, a lot of my own studying I believe came from um, looking at content and just doing more practice questions from there. Yeah, I would definitely agree with um, that previous statement that OG mentioned. Uh, these classes, even though they can give you a good idea, they're not exactly designed to be MCAT classes. So you're gonna have information that might not be pertinent. Um, for example, uh, a lot of my classes, like I mentioned previously, uh, especially biochem, uh, genetics, my molecular classes, those made anything DNA or molecular related extremely easy. If I saw that in like an MCAT practice book, I would just kind of skim over the section because I knew that really well. Uh, but in contrast, um, anything anatomy based, I would have to give a bit more study because your general biology or any upper divs, depending on your major, it's not going to cover it completely. So you do have to supplement um, some of your studying to essentially cover the bases that uh, weren't uh, covered by your upper divs. Thank you. So I'm going to add a little context to a couple questions added in the chat and then turn it back over to the panelists. A few students have asked what coursework needs to be completed to successfully prepare for the MCAT. Um, and generally speaking, that's going to be calculus, 
statistics, general chemistry, general biology, organic chemistry, physics, biochemistry, psychology, and sociology. Those would be courses that should be completed prior to preparing for the MCAT. Turning it back over to you all, can you speak to the types of questions that are asked on the MCAT in relation to the logic that the MCAT is using when they pose questions and have uh, answer banks, right? Like what is the what is the logic that the AAMC is using when they ask MCAT questions? Valeria, I don't think I'm making sense, am I? Let's have- No, oh yeah, sorry to interrupt. You totally are. I just don't know how easy it is to put into words. I feel like it's something you experience when you do the official material, if you can get your hands on that and just, uh, yeah, maybe someone else can explain it better than I can. Yeah, I'm looking like I have like a page of like a bunch of when I review, I like screenshot a bunch of like the questions of like, all the ones I got wrong. Um, and so I'm trying to like look to see if we can find an example of it. But I think it really is something that just comes with when like you actually see it yourself and try to like integrate it. Like we can, I guess, do our best to explain um, some of how they try to, I guess, give you maybe a more obvious answer. And sometimes you have to like pick an extra layer to it um, or just what they want you to like how they want to integrate information like when you're learning it in school you're learning things in kind of context that just from what you've done from chemistry from the previous sections like chem 1a and chem 1b when you're like integrating that to chem 1c but i think some of the questions here they like to integrate um, both physics and chemistry and sometimes with like neuroscience as well like there's a lot of sort of intercourse um integration of uh, different I guess, sources or bodies of knowledge that you just need to be able to put together and practice putting together in a way that you're not really expected to when you're taking courses individually at UCR or any undergrad, to be honest. Yeah, it's also a lot of reading comprehension, reading those long passages that you don't really do during prereqs to understand what are they actually asking. Like, it might not be as obvious as it has been on like multiple choice exams during prereqs. Yeah, especially it's, I think the MCAT is completely different from any test you'll take in undergrad. Uh, a lot of it is kind of that critical thinking, that um, mixing of different types of content. Uh, for example, you might have a question where if you don't know one specific aspect, if you're stronger in like another specific aspect, you might be able to use some critical thinking to uh, piece together what the correct answer would be. So that kind of shows how everything is interconnected at that point. I think one other thing that I remembered is that um, part of what we're talking about is that oftentimes the prompts will give you a lot of information too, of which they'll give you like just maybe some like either portion of an article or they'll give you some like diagram of like I'm looking at some like physics uh, diagram or some like random thing that is partially explained but you need a lot of extra context to be able to fully understand what's going on in that question and how to extrapolate the answer from that and so I feel like that's where it's different where they'll give you like part of what you need for an information and you kind of have to fill in the bubbles for some of the questions it's not like all of them and there's a lot of different ways that they try to like I guess, test your reasoning. And it really just, my whole tactic to the MCAT from my perspective is practice makes perfect. Um, I think that was like the biggest thing for me, like content and studying, um, in my opinion, really only gets you so far. Like, at least from my like perspective, like content and just general prep only got me um, they actually it really didn't get me very far at all. It just got me the basic, like the, like the foundation to then build off of. I know everyone else's experience is different, but for my own, it really just came with doing a lot of practice to it. So that's, I guess my best way to do it is just go out and see. Yeah, not to scare anyone. There are some questions that are straightforward, kind of like recall or a calculation, but it is a mix. Yeah, I agree. Foundationally, the MCAT is an application test. It's, it's your, your ability to apply knowledge in new situations. It's not a regurgitation exam. 
So on that same note, let's move into um, some other questions. And these are all very congruent with things that we're seeing from our student audience in the chat. Um, you all can take any of these three that you want, all of them in no particular order, but these are all questions that are coming up in the chat is what type of free or low cost prep products have you found to be most helpful? In addition to if there were any particular test prep companies that you found particularly helpful and OG to your fantastic point, where do we get those sample questions and those sample exams? Any banks that you pulled from for those practice questions? Um, for free content, I actually use a lot of Khan Academy. Like I think I went through all their practice questions, which was a lot. I just um, did those at the beginning because I knew they weren't like super official, super similar to double AMC logic, but they were good for finding out uh, what I knew, what I didn't know, and it's perfect because if you're getting questions wrong, you can watch the video uh, on that section and kind of just, yeah, for um, the beginning of studying, I would use that. Uh, practice questions, sample exams. So I had Kaplan, I had the books, and then it came with a bunch of uh, free online full links, like four or five or something, and then what I would also say for practice questions and exams, I would check out like every test prep company that you can think of, because usually each one will have like one free full laying for like a small amount of free content. So you can just get that. So you're not paying for a bunch of different things. Um, and then the double AMC um, stuff is like, I think it's required because you really have to see how they would actually ask the questions and get a feel for it. Um, and there is a, I believe there's a program where you can get part of that fee waived or get a discount um, based on your income. So make sure you look into that before paying just to see if you can um, save some money there. Um, test prep companies, I don't think it matters too much among the big ones like Kaplan or the Princeton Review. If you're going to pay for something, just pick one, um, figure out if you want the books or just the full lengths. Um, but I think any of the big names will get you there if you just stick with that. Oh, I would completely agree, um, I, especially with the Kaplan. I think that that's one of the best resources that's completely free. Um, it's not only just for getting practice, but I think also for solidifying the content. When I was going through, I think one of the most important things when you're preparing is not just, you know, the volume or how many times you do it, but it's how you review it as well. And I think Kaplan has a really good like, if like, like had like a section of like, I got these type of questions wrong. I need to review this topic. Like Kaplan was one of the first places that I went to to look for YouTube videos. Um, me and Sal were best friends for a while. Um, and <laughs> um, just, <laughs> just kind of everything that was going on with Kaplan. And I think a couple other things was uh, Jack Weston was a website that I used that I think is somewhat resemblant of what Cars Passages is like. I think they, they like gave out a free passage each day with like questions and stuff with and a timer. And they kind of made it look similar to like the same screen that um, the practice exams use. So I think that that was something that I used was free. Um, and then uh, as far as like paying for resources, like there's like, uh, I think Blair put it well, there's a lot of them out there. Just choose one and stick with it. And I think again, kind of practice makes perfect on that sense. If I see anything else, I'll, I'll add in later. Yeah, I would definitely have to agree. I actually used uh, Kaplan materials as well. I really think they prepared me, uh, especially those full length exams. Uh, I strongly suggest doing the full length exams because for me personally, I think that was the most helpful thing. It allowed me to get kind of a feel for how the MCAT would be. Um, and then also just to add on uh, what Valeria said earlier, that AAMC material, the official material, it's kind of like your holy grail. Um, I would definitely, if you had to buy anything, I would buy that. Uh, but you can definitely find a lot of free full length exams online. Uh, if you do enough digging, Khan Academy is definitely helpful if you wanna keep uh, kind of costs low. And, but yeah, I really think just looking out, uh, searching like websites like Reddit or student for network, be wary because sometimes those websites can be a bit crazy, but if you are able to find 
links to free full length exams. Uh, I think that's one of the best ways that you might be able to practice. Oh, for the, the Holy Grail, I said the official AAMC uh, MCAT material. Uh, for me, they, when I bought it, it came with uh, four full length exams. I use those in the final four weeks before my MCAT because they are the most representative of the actual MCAT exam. Thank you, Nick. I 100% agree with that. In terms of free and low cost prep products, um, the AAMC is the organization who writes the MCAT, administers the MCAT, scores the MCAT, and reports the MCAT, and they have both free and low cost resources, which I've put into the chat and will continue to do so. Valeria had a correction in the chat in relation to uh, free test prep products is Khan, um, Khan Academy. Yes, not Kaplan. So I think there was a, a reference to Kaplan being free. That would be Khan Academy is the free MCAT prep material. So thank you for that information, everybody. Our next question as it continues to relate to preparation material is, for those of you who prepared for the MCAT while in the academic year, how did you balance your academic courses with your MCAT prep? Uh, so for me personally, when I had to do that, I was a little bit ahead on my units uh, and my credits for my classes. So I decided that the quarter leading up to my exam, I was only going to take three classes. Uh, I made sure to stack these classes so that I had uh, my Friday free. So essentially, every Friday, I would take a full length MCAT exam. And then on Saturday and Sunday, that would be a good chance for me to review the exam. And I think it's really important that you give yourself time to review the exam as well as take it because that's how you learn from your mistakes. Uh, and I, I don't mean like you just look at it and see what you got wrong. If you get a question wrong, I would highly recommend looking up uh, specific questions. Like I could say AMC full length uh, two question X on uh, X section. And I could find an explanation if I didn't completely understand how to get it. Uh, but overall, I think it's really important to try to make space for it if you can. If you are able to take less course load, that might be ideal, but I do realize that that's not always, always uh, possible. So I would say just try to balance it as best as you can. Thank you. I think Nick might have been the only one to take the exam during his academic year. If the next question as it relates to preparation material, um, if you can share with the audience the sections or the content that you focused on more and sections or content that maybe came a little easier or more natural. So how did you divide your time among the four sections and the innumerable topics that are covered on the exam? So kind of something that, um, well, at least one part of that that I think is worthwhile noting is um, cars. I think one thing, at least in my experience, is that I couldn't teach myself how to read in two months. And so I think that that's something that um, you really need ought to know kind of before. And if you have the luxury, kind of start reading just generally like any type of, I guess, public literature, newspapers, or like kind of articles that get posted, whatever it is, like the Jack Webster Weston website um, is decent for content, wherever you can get your hands on just integrating like that sort of reading and comprehension and application part of your brain in the language sense, I think is a really good idea because as a neuro major, that wasn't anything that really came up as much. I wasn't, it wasn't a part of my brain that I was, um, not any good at. And that was definitely my hardest section. And I think that it's also the hardest thing to improve last second. So if you're kind of coming down to the crunch time, and you really want to get like those last few points. Um, 
cars like the only way that i found like different ways to improve was trying to changing my tactics and strategies with like, the limited amount of time um especially if you're i'm a slower reader i'm not the fastest reader out there i don't know if i'm even average but there are different uh ways kind of going around it to like just make sure i'm investing time in questions that are likely that i'm likely to get right and maybe saving questions that i'm maybe less likely to get right for the end when if i don't get to it i might have missed them anyways and there's a bunch of different strategies that i looked up on youtube uh, as a way to like i just tried a bunch of different things to kind of improve on that but that one is something that you, if you can start earlier um and that's just a skill that is developed over time and not like a two-month period in my in my personal experience um as far as some of the other ones i think um Chem phys, I was an SI for chem, so I think that really kind of came in handy as far as like just integrating that material. Um, and I think the bio was like a little bit more in hand with a lot of my CNAS prereqs as well. Um, and so I think that those two are a little bit, um, like came a little, they were definitely still challenging. I think I really needed to still practice just integrating and um, using, like just getting used to like the MCAT format. Uh, and for psych social, I think a lot of that just came from um, getting the knowledge and materials. So I think it was a lot of it was content-based that I think gets got me about 75% of the way there. It's just like I saw, I think on Reddit, there's a long, long page of just all the facts that you need to know and like using whatever like material you want to use to just kind of download that information. But that still only gets you 75% of the way. So I think that that one, um, um, that also just came with more practice and how to like figure out like oh which type of bias this is or which type of um whatever type of like just general content or concept that is so i guess be my take on it yeah i definitely agree with a lot of that i think it's also important to try to suss out what uh topics might be high yield versus low yield like i remember back at ucr taking physics i didn't hate it or anything but it wasn't my favorite so i was like oh my god i'm gonna have to know how to do all these calculations again but uh i think when i had the kaplan books they broke it down like that 11 percent of the content was physics or whatever on the exam which i don't know how accurate that is but um, in my experience, I definitely didn't need to know the type of physics calculations that would have nothing to do with like a human or like the other sciences. So things like that, uh, knowing that amino acids are high yield, um, I'd say basically biochem and bio topics that were covered in undergrad in, um, UCR's prereqs are generally high yield, um, for psych so I agree that it's a lot of like kind of like vocabulary vocabulary words um that section I feel like a lot of the questions are more straightforward like do you know this or not and there is a lot of differentiating between different types of biases or social processes that um you kind of just got to memorize what all those terms mean um and I think the best way to decide where to spend your time is to do practice questions, do a full length, um, like even do one early in your studying, like if you find a free one on a random test prep site and just do it to try it out, see what sections you're doing better or worse on um, and go from there. Yeah, I really agree um, with the whole idea of taking full lengths because you might believe you know a subject well, but until you're actually putting it into practice, that's when you find out uh, what you know and what you don't know. Um, so similar to OG, I, I really think CARS is something you, you really need to kind of know. I don't really think there's a right way to study for it, except practicing with like Jack Weston or even just reading a lot. Uh, for me, one kind of strategy I found helpful with CARS actually was before reading any of the sections, I would write one through nine at the top of a piece of paper. I would flip through each of the nine sections and I would write down if it's easy or hard. Because on one hand, you could have something like uh, a short article talking about like comic books, but then you could also have like medieval poetry or something like that. And yeah, so that would be definitely something I would categorize as hard. Um, so if you're able to do that, I think you can balance your time better because if you have to score points on the easy section, it's kind of like free points, whereas you don't want to spend a lot of time uh, on a hard section and knowing that you might not get a lot of points on that. Uh, for bio, biochem, I think a lot of the CNS classes prepare you for that. 
physics and chem, you really just need to practice, I think. Uh, and then psych, yeah, you really need to kind of study it because it is like what Valeria said, a lot of uh, definitions, a lot of terms. If you don't know them, uh, you're going to have a hard time in psych, which is uh, what I felt a lot. So yeah, I think in the final weeks, I was doing Anki flashcard after flashcard of just the psych section because that was always historically my lowest on all of my practice tests uh, that I ever took. So yeah, essentially to wrap it up, your practice test will show you what you don't know. Focus on what you don't know. Thank you, panelists. So the audience knows exactly where uh, we're going with this conversation. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, readiness as it relates to mental and emotional readiness how you maintain motivation or momentum to study, um, perhaps in the space of COVID, although to our audience, I don't believe that any of our panelists took the MCAT during COVID. Um, Nick did, yes? Okay, so Nick can speak to the COVID piece. Valeria and OG were fortunate to take the MCAT before the pandemic presented itself. And then lastly, um, how did you know you were ready to sit for and take the exam? So I'll pose those questions to you all as well as collecting from the chat. Yeah, so this is something that I personally struggled with a lot. Um, I've always been the type to put a lot of pressure on myself. I, I get kind of nervous about like important exams. And so I'll, especially reading some of the posts you might see on like Reddit or Student Doctor Network. I mentioned previously, those can get a bit crazy sometimes if you read them and if you are kind of prone to things on the internet hurting you mentally, you might not want to read those. Um, and then when I had my personal experience that forced me to push my MCAT exam back, I really needed help mentally. So I utilized CAPS at UCR is essentially what I did. I scheduled an appointment with a counselor. I spoke to them. And I think that's really important if you are someone who struggles with that mental and emotional aspect of the MCAT. Uh, I was never really the type to take the time to relax. I always like to study a lot. And I learned that that's not how you prepare for the MCAT. If you study all day, every day, you're going to burn yourself out. So what I like to do was I started to set up a time, uh, one hour every day that was just dedicated to walking. And I would walk, I would listen to music. I would not look at my phone, not any emails. And I really think that helped because when you can get that psychological aspect of the MCAT down, you are able to be more motivated to study as opposed to when I was studying 12 hours a day, I immediately burned out after like a week. Um, so kind of, a, I 120% agree, like not even 10, 120%. Like it is like, you can't, I think from like logically from an efficiency standpoint, I find myself doing so much better when you incorporate time for you to rest, integrate the material, make sure you're getting a good amount of sleep every day. Um, like it's very different from, I think how a lot of us may approach undergrad where you're kind of really trying to go at it really hard and trying to like, oh, like for, I have a chem final coming up, like for the next week, I'm just gonna put my mental health to the side and just really push at it or something. Um, and I know that, you know, that's a strategy a lot of um, undergrads like took towards like doing well for things like that. But I really think that you gotta, like, I remember every single week that I was studying, I always had at least like one break day. Like it would be like either one Sunday or Saturday where me and my partner we were studying would just go off and do something that has nothing to do with studying, like nothing at all. And that was extremely, extremely helpful and sustainable, I think. And I think uh, the online like websites and servers literally remember anybody can log on to, um, I forgot, like student doctor network or whatever. And say that they got a 529 and a letter from Dr. Fauci himself. Like anybody can log on and say any of those things. So when you're going there and seeing all these things and just like, don't let that get to your, like your mind. Everyone's going at their own pace. And that was so big for me to just take a step back and realize that I'm going at it at my own way. And I think that 
also kind of knowing when you're ready is a lot of like the practice sets when you're seeing your scores to get to where you want to be. Uh, and that was a big thing for me that I really wish I did before I took it my first time, because I kind of was viewing off of a scale that um, I had sort of a heuristic of a scale that I thought that I had a score that was good enough because it was better than a certain school that I had in mind that with their average was. So I was like, I should be all right. Then when I hopped on to MSAR, which is um, A-M-S-A-R, I'm not exactly sure what that stands for. I can look that up in the meantime, but MSAR. SAR, um, it's like the MCAS website for looking up just um, admissions for all the different schools, all the different statistics. And I was able to go in there and see where my average ranked upon like the schools that I wanted to go to. And knowing that ahead of time, oh, thank you so much, Amber. Um, knowing that ahead of time, I think would be very helpful in knowing that if you're averaging about where you want to go for what school that you want to get into, then you're ready to take it. And when it comes to like, the actual exam, it's like, you know, you're practicing, you set the test environment as close to simulation as to when you're actually going to be taking the test and you know again that practice makes perfect you're not going to go in your bed and like while you're like lying down and opening up and you're taking it if you're getting like extremely good scores while you're like in the like weird comfortable zone and you go into this new environment you go into like this kind of environment where you have to be ready to sit down and you can't like be drinking um, water eating snacks along the way like you just kind of know that you have to be able to simulate everything the right way you take breaks along the way um like as far as like practicing and studying and once you're ready you're ready to go at it it's kind of like my sort of general like spiel is go at your own pace and when you're ready just go ahead and take it yeah i definitely completely agree with everything that's been said it's a balance of having self-care and then also self-discipline um yeah just you know try to enjoy some of the studying don't like be miserable while you're doing it uh you know find ways to improve if you want to watch videos that explain stuff in an interesting way um and definitely keep track of your progress look back because i think the way that you feel ready is kind of you trust yourself and how do you trust yourself that's when you have um evidence that you're ready so you know you took all these prereqs and passed them you know you already learned this once and then as you take uh practice questions and practice full lengths you'll um, see your knowledge growing over time and your confidence should grow along with that. And I definitely agree with simulating the test environment. I think that's really helpful. Like I would plan out what snacks I was gonna have to get like the perfect amount of sugar and like everything I needed to keep me going throughout that long test. Um, and yeah, stay motivated. Remember why you're doing this. Remember how far you've already come um, and keep going and take a break when you need to. A couple other like super quick mental health things that um, came up was just uh, one thing that was helpful for me when I came like naturally I think it being such a long process like doubts me start creeping in and you start might like start thinking um I don't know I, I had many points I had like doubt where doubt points where I almost want to like break down and be like oh like you know why am I even here and I think one thing that Valeria said that was really important is remember why you're doing this remember how far you've come I at one point I wrote up on like my whiteboard I wrote up like like again I'm gonna assume it like MD or something and I had that up like on my board so that every day I woke up and I was like you know that's that's gonna come to that's gonna happen that's gonna happen one day and I just looked at that like almost every day I'll just seat up and it's just kind of like inspiration for myself like no matter what I've done so much like wrote down all my like uh all of the things that I had like gotten over I was able to like accomplish like throughout before then like other challenges other adversities you've all lived to this there's no way you haven't overcome like some whatever adversity that has made your story you to get to where you are right now and you look back at the same person that overcame all of those different tactics all of those different adversities is the same person that's going to overcome this challenge that's in front of you today and that's just something you have to be able to to tell yourself um and the last thing was more of a logistical thing the snacks um i 110 agree with that like whatever you're gonna eat like on test day is what you're eating while you're taking the practice test like whatever like you're gonna like type of like clothes you're gonna wear whatever like you can get as religious as you want into it but however as much as you can do it so eating is a huge thing i know someone that changed up their meal on like game day and had to use the bathroom at a weird ass time and just messed everything up and like they needed to use the bathroom in the middle of one of their like exams and like they couldn't like think because they needed to pee because they drink like a really different amount of what they usually do everything like those little things can matter so as much as you can really try to make it as close to game day as possible thank you you all are brilliant. That is all incredibly helpful. And Valeria, you said something incredibly powerful, which was balancing self-care versus self-discipline. And I think that's a really 
beautiful way to summarize what we're saying here is um, the MCATs work, right? At the end of the day, it's a lot of work. It takes a lot of discipline and motivation, but you can't necessarily forego your self-care to um, accomplish that process. So thank you for bringing that up. There were two very interesting questions that I'd like us to wrap our time up with. Um, the first being, were there any extracurricular experiences that you engaged in that you felt were particularly helpful for your MCAT prep? And then I'll give you the second question after this first one. Oh, Gia, you kind of addressed this in the chat. So maybe you want to um, start with the, you had mentioned SI and some other things. So any extracurriculars, I think SI is a really great one that helps you with MCAT prep. I would say, I think that was probably one of my favorite uh, as far as like just preparation wise. Uh, you remember, I think about a certain percentage, like 50% of like what you hear, 60% of like what you like read or something. But I can remember it was like 90% of what you teach. Um, and so when like having to like, I think teach chemistry and bio for several quarters, I was able to really understand, I think that basic material a lot better going into it. And so I like, as an SI, you go and you sit down in like the lecture halls and you re, like you have to, you have to rewatch it over again. So you're basically taking the course twice while getting paid to do it, which is amazing. Um, and I thought that that was, I don't know, to all my SLs out there, you, you guys are doing it right. Um, and I think that there's a lot of other things too that I think I put on there, like ULAs for um, like labs for certain like, like bio courses, or um, I think the chem courses as well, just anything that it's integrated with that. And then also extracurricular groups that has like sort of either um, I think mentorship programs, I think were like really helpful for me and just getting content from like this isn't exactly like content wise, but this is more so for like getting other like ideas, getting support. And like I was really, really involved in them, too. And there was a lot of, I think, resources and support that I got from them. And I know there's a lot of great orgs out there. That was just the one that um, I was the most involved in. And I got a lot of help from as well. And just kind of like that, I guess, mentorship and guidance and also support from outside of just doing the academics. That was really helpful. Yeah, I don't know if any of my extracurriculars were particularly related. I didn't do too many academic ones. All right, so thank you for that, OG. I've heard that many times over that SI is uh, truly helpful for MCAT prep because to your point, you remember 90% of what you teach to others. So the last question, and we'll uh, end on a summarization of our resources today, but the last question, and I think this is my favorite one we've gotten through the chat. Can you please tell us something that you wish you knew before you had taken the MCAT? Something you didn't know that you wish you would have known prior to taking the exam? That's a heavy one, right? I feel like there was a lot of things I wish I knew. <laughs> I'll start and let you guys think. I've obviously never taken the exam, nor will I ever take the exam. But one um, piece that I regularly hear from students is not realizing how much time building reading comprehension skills is going to be to successfully pass the car section. To OG's point, uh, reading comprehension is a skill set that's built over time. It's not something you can cram for like physics. So that's a piece of advice that I've regularly heard from my advisees um, as they reflect on their MCAT preparation is they wish they had done more reading and writing throughout their undergraduate education to not only help with the CARS section, but also to help with the essay writing in the application. So um, anything that you guys would like to add of what you wish you would have known sooner? I think mine remains uh, the same as far as wishing I didn't spend so much time 
in content review for me personally. Um, like, I kid you not, I took a diagnostic. I kind of, I, I like the idea of taking a diagnostic beforehand because you can kind of see where you're going and how to tailor your content. And I took a diagnostic um, right as I started. It's the first thing I did. And I went through like over, like a little over a month of just straight content reviewing, just learning and going through all the different capital books and all the different resources. And after that, like month and week that of content reviewing when I took my next test, I literally went up just one point. I was like really so demoralizing. Obviously, everyone else has their own experience. And my the partner that I was uh, studying with at the time had a very similar experience where we just really didn't get anywhere after doing that. But it wasn't after I started taking the practice exams and like realizing like it's because there's so much content, like some of which is more high yield, some of which is lower yield, some of which is like actually like stuff that is easier to apply. And after you start taking those questions, you start realizing why you're getting certain questions wrong or why you're getting them right. You know how to then tailor your study a little bit more applicably. And so I think that was one of my biggest mistakes. And then the cars thing, yeah, that's that's just, uh, you have to really start at that a little bit earlier on um, and tactics wise. I'll let Nick and Valeria marinate. If there's anything you wanna add, feel free to jump in. Um, Valeria also beautifully brought up the financial assistance program or the FAP program within the AAMC. So I will pull that up and drop that in the chat as well. If you are a Pell grant and or Cal grant student, you'll very likely get approved for FAP status. Not only will that provide you with some free MCAT prep material from the AAMC, but it will also reduce the cost of the MCAT as a whole as well as provide some free applications to AMCAS when you get ready to submit your application. So I'll drop that um, FAP resource in the chat, as well as the MSAR, which OG mentioned as a fantastic resource to look up data as it relates to individual medical schools. Just to wrap up our last couple slides here, again, the HPAC MCAT handout is on a QR code there on the slide. It was also provided in the chat along with our panelists' bios and their blogs. So each of our three panelists today have provided HPAC with a written blog of how they prepared for the MCAT. And that is hosted on our uh, website, which I'll drop into the chat again. This is a summary of the six most common resources that you would find out of reading those blogs. There are five blogs in total. So universally, our panelists recommend the AAMC MCAT prep material, as well as Khan Academy for free and low cost prep material. There's also blogs written by both HPAC uh, past students or UCR past students and AAMC applicants. These blogs have been vetted by either a staff at HPAC or a staff at the AAMC. They are real humans with real scores and honest and genuine information on how to prepare for the exam. As our panelists have mentioned to you all today, you need to be wary of student forums and blogs on the internet as a whole and be a conscientious um, human about what is constructive information and what is destructive information that you might find on the uh, SDNs and Reddits of the world. So if you're looking for blogs, I very much would recommend what my office has posted as well as the AAMC. There's about 40 blogs on the AAMC. It's very robust. Anki flashcards has been a very regular recommendation for MCAT prep over the last few years. And as we just talked about, reading, 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 reading is highly important, not only for the CARS section, but in all reality, many of the passages, even in the bio section, the physics section, and the psych and social section might be a half a page long. And if you are not a uh, speed reader, a diligent reader, then you might struggle to get through the content and then that will impact your pacing on the exam. So although many pre-med students are science majors, reading and writing skills are extremely important and translatable to exam prep um, and 
just success in the workforce as a whole. If you are looking for a for-profit test prep company to provide you some MCAT prep, Blueprint, Kaplan, Princeton, and UWorld regularly came up from our blog contributors as programs that they found um, enjoyable and successful. Lastly, I would like to just absolutely graciously thank our panelists today. I have known and worked with each panelist for years, and they are giving thoughtful, intelligent, hardworking, motivated humans that are all going to make fantastic physicians who have taken time out of their very busy medical school schedules to come and speak with you today. So thank you, Nick, Valeria, and OG. Yes, it is very cold where Valeria and OG are currently living in St. Louis in Connecticut. That's come up quite a bit in the chat. Uh, just to wrap us up, the contact information for the Health Professions Advising Center is on our slide now. Several of you have asked how to contact the office and schedule an appointment. We are currently using a Google phone number. So 951-888-1290 is a Google number, which means you can call or text. We are located in the Rivera Library, room B03. It's in the basement level of the library, and we will be on campus Monday, January the 31st, so come and see us. Our website is hpac.ucr.edu, which is generally the same as our email, and we have not only an email listserv, we also have a social media presence on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and of course via Zoom. This session has been recorded and will be posted on our HPAC YouTube channel for anybody who would like to rewatch post session.